can anybody, so we are going to start with the lectures by Professor Donald. In, uh, tell us uh, everything about uh, how to model uh, adonic collisions with modern uh, event generators. Uh, one thing for uh, this afternoon tutorial session, uh, since the tutorial will be something really hands-on, uh, trying to really use these tools, and uh, you will need uh, your own laptop. So uh, you see that there are uh, not uh, so many flatwood here. So uh, if you have problem in putting your battery, etc., maybe since there is the, uh, a, a room, uh, a, a Zoom room in any case, uh, which, uh, through which we give these lectures, uh, maybe uh, if you, are, you need to connect uh, uh, your laptop to the electricity, you can also attend uh, uh, the tutorial session via Zoom uh, in your uh, office at your desk. Otherwise, you can stay here if you have uh, no problem with uh, your partner. Okay. And uh, so I don't see uh, other time, and I think we can start the next slide. Yes, we'll sort out those details uh, after lunch. So, hi, I'm Leif Lundblad. Uh, I've been working for uh, with the event generators, uh, most of my active physicist life. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you something of, of how it works uh, and, and what we do and, and the theoretical foundation for it and, and, and so on. Uh, the outline of the lectures will be something like this. Today, I will talk about the real basics of event generation. Uh, tomorrow, I will talk about uh, things like parton showers, down to hadronization, so starting with the soft stuff that is promised by the uh, title of the lectures. Uh, and then in lecture three on Monday, we will talk about uh, minimum bias and underlying events, uh, again, soft stuff stuff and and i will also kind of summarize a bit about what we have available as event generators and i will then talk about general purpose event generators which of which there are only three uh one is called pythia that's what i'm working on and there's one called herwig and one called sherpa uh, and they all do things like you just tell you tell the generator what you want and it will give you something maybe not what you want but it will give you something uh, and some of the event generators are better on some stuff some are more suited for hard physics and some are more suited for soft physics and i think we all agree among these event generators that pythia is where to go if you want to understand soft physics. And then in the last lecture, we will have, uh, I will talk about how we model heavy ion collisions in Pythia uh, and compare to other ways of doing it. I guess you've heard a bit about uh, understanding heavy ion collisions already. Um, and after that lecture, there will also be a tutorial uh, where you get to actually generate these events and, and analyze them, and see what you get. But today, uh, I will talk about Monte Carlo integration. So Monte Carlo, you've probably heard of, uh, but I'm going to explain how we use it in event generators and then i will talk a bit about how things are factorized and uh, start with the kind of the the first thing you do when you generate events which is to generate some kind of hard or semi-hard matrix element of a few part on uh, processes but i'm going to start with Monte Carlo integration. So 
this is the technique that has been around uh, even before we had computers. Uh, maybe not explicitly, it actually dates back to uh, a French guy who, uh, who threw needles on the floor to calculate pi. And this wooden floor, so it's long lines and two needles. And if the probability for a needle to actually cross between two uh, pieces of wood, you can calculate numerically the value of pi. We're not going to do that, but if you want, you can. You can, you can. So the question is, in general, how do uh, numerically evaluate any integral over a weird uh, phase space, uh, many dimensions, and of a complex function. Uh, and we have things like Gaussian quadrature that are very good numerical approximations. Uh, we have Simpson's rule. Uh, but these can, in fact, be very inefficient especially if we have many dimensions, there it is. Uh, and this region of integration is complicated. And sometimes you have peaks and divergences and that's not fun, but you have to handle it in some way. So it turns out the most efficient way of doing this is to just randomly select the number of points in, in the allowed phase space, sample the function in there and make an average. Uh, the, the most stupid thing you can do turns out to be the most efficient. <laughs> so you have a, a probability function for where you uh, have random variables in n dimensions and you have limits on these and they are described by a probability density function, right? Now, you can use any kind of probability density function. And if you take the integral, you multiply and divide. And you know that from the central limit theorem, uh, any average of a random var variable is given, well, it's not central limit theorem. It's, it's just definition of, of something. So you have this probability density, this G is now F over the probability density uh, and the average G of Y, the random variables, uh, is actually this integral. And it's fairly easy to see. Just take the average of this and, and you will get uh, the average of, of, of the samplings you do. And, and that will give you a numerical estimate of the integral. And it's easy, right? It, you can really do this in a few lines of codes, even for a very complex function. It's, it's no problem. When we do it, we get an error. And the error is proportional to the variance in this thing that you measure. If it va varies wildly, then you will get a bad approximation. And if it doesn't vary at all, then you get a perfect approximation. It's easy. Now, the error you get is proportional to one over the square root of number of points you have to generate. And that seems like a, that's, that's a bad convergence, right? You can take other uh, numerical estimates. Simpson's rule is where you simply have bins and you check the function in each bin. Uh, and if you have n bins, you have, have to evaluate n times. Uh, the Simpson's rule is, is efficient because, oops, uh, for uh, one dimension, it actually, the error goes like one over the n to the power four, which is good, right? But if you have more dimensions, it get, becomes slower. So if you have 
eight dimensions, it will be as fast as doing the random stuff. We're going to talk about much higher dimensions than that. We'll come to that in a second. So um, if we can get random numbers according to distribution, which is proportional to what we're trying to measure, then of course, we would be very happy because then we have a variance of zero because the ratio is always constant. And uh, we will get a perfect thing. We just have to throw one number and we get the right answer, right? More or less. This is not always the case. This F is not always positive. So if it's randomly up and down, you, you get a bad convergence with this, but never mind. And the problem is that you need to choose this random distribution very carefully because you can go into situations where the variance is actually infinite. Uh, and, and the error is, will never become finite. So doing this is in general difficult. It basically amounts to solving the integral <laughs> analytically. <laughs> so it's, it's difficult to get, but there are some tricks that you can use. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those tricks uh, because I think they're kind of fine. So on your computer, you will have random numbers. Uh, typically you will have random numbers between zero and one according to a completely flat distribution. Uh, so the probability density function looks like this. Now, the thing is that we can tr transform any random distribution into another random distribution if we want by looking at the cumulative distribution. So if you have something that you want, which is this P of Y, and, and you take the integral from minus infinity to a given value, the probability below there, you equate that with the probability of a completely flat random number between zero and R, zero because minus infinity doesn't give you anything. And you do that and, and you, you get your random function. So if you can then calculate the inverse of this cumulative distribution, and this is a monotonically increasing function, if you have to have that because you need to take the inverse here, uh, you can you can create any random distribution from a flat distribution. And it goes something like that. It's, it's similar to just choosing a, a variable substitution in your integral. And, and you will see uh, that, that it works out. The problem, of course, is that this PY uh, inverse is often difficult to write down uh, numer uh, analytically. Uh, and so we need some other tricks. Uh, the most simple trick is the so-called accept reject method. So you have a probability distribution, uh, E prime of Y, or P, this guy here, PY prime of Y, uh, and you want this. And you know, because you've checked, that if you multiply this with a constant, it is larger than PY, the, one, the thing you want everywhere. So what you do is that you generate a Y prime according to the known random distribution, but the thing you can generate, and then you generate another flat random number between zero and one. And if the value of the probability density function you want divided by C, this constant times the other the thing you have, 
is larger than r, then you accept that's the that's a good number. Otherwise, you reject it and start over again. So, I, I mean, in principle, this means you can say it instead of so uh, you have. I don't have a microphone anymore. Let's, let's say that the known random distribution is just constant, right? So you have your function in some interval uh, as a function of y, and this function p looks weird, right? But you know, with a flat distribution, you can generate points in this phase, phase space here. So you generate a y and an r times this overestimated, overestimated function and ends up there that you keep or, in, and you will cover this completely equally everywhere, but you only keep the points below here. And it's quite easy to see that that means that you get the distribution according to this weird curve by this very simple uh, uh, prescription of how to do it. So if you have a weird, but limited function, you can always do this. Of course, if this function has a divergence somewhere, you, you, you have to do other stuff, right? But in principle, this can always be done. Accept, reject. It's the simplest one, and so you very often use it. I will come to a couple of other stuff later on. You can also uh, divide things up. If you have uh, a weird function you want to sample, uh, p of x that has maybe uh, a peak somewhere, and you realize that that peak is very high compared to everything else. So to doing uh, overestimate there, you will have to throw away a lot of points. And you don't want to throw away points because that's expensive, right? You can calculate how efficient this is by looking at the relative integrals. Uh, what you do is that you divide the overestimate, the overestimated function into a sum of functions, right? And these functions you know, so you can calculate the area of each of the functions. So you choose your thing here a bit differently. First, you select which functions to choose according to their relative area. And then you select according to that, and this is a known function that you know the probability density of, so, and you can generate according to it. And then you throw away the thing you generate with actually the full function divided by the sum of the overestimated functions. So if you want to have the correct integral here, you divide by g of x and sum of g of x, that's the same thing. You can get out the, the correct integral uh, if you see what we're doing here. The easiest thing is this just to think about having functions in different intervals. It, it works in the same way. So again, if we have something like this, we could decide to have uh, divided up here. So you have one overestimate here, one here, and one here. Because you know where this 
peak is. It's, it's the invariant mass of the Higgs or whatever. So you know you want to sample here more than there. So this, these areas is, you decide which point do I want to sample? Well, maybe I want to sample here. And then you throw a random number in here and in, in this area, and it can be outside or inside that function. Uh, same thing here. And in the end, you will have a nice distribution of this peak, whatever it is. So how do we get random numbers? <laughs> we don't have needle, yes? We want to look after the number of maximum number of samples. Excuse me? What to say that we have to generate the maximum suppose I'm generating two thousand samples, so maximum has to be within that peak area. Is that what you what, what I want to say is if we didn't divide it up and we only have a, a flat random number to do it with, this doesn't work very well. Just wait instead. If we instead did the whole thing here, we would have to throw away much more random numbers. So for efficiency's sake, we divide it up so that we sample this area less and this area more and this area less. Uh, but we keep more points that we generate. My question is suppose I can only generate 2,000 samples. Yeah. I decide to sample the Because you know these AIs here. You, you select, you start with selecting an area that you sh should sample in. And so you sample more in this because the area of the overestimate is larger there. You sample less in these because they have a smaller area. So you use the relative uh, size of these regions to select where to sample. And then you sample with a normal accept reject. And, and that makes it much more efficient. Yeah, the, the, the alternative is to say, well, I have one function that is, I know works for the peak. And then I have some, some function which works for this, uh, but this is a bit diff more difficult to draw <laughs> how you do. It's easier to just, it, it works better. It's called, both are called multi-channel in some sense, but. Uh, Okay, so there are actually true random number generators around hardware stuff where you really get uh, completely random numbers due to some quantum mechanical fluctuations in some circuit somewhere. Uh, and that sounds like a good thing to have, but actually we prefer what we call pseudo random numbers. It's random number sequences that look random, but uh, are actually completely deterministic. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you go to your computer, uh, if you have a Unix computer and you type rand, you will get a random number. Uh, and it, it typically works with something called a linear congruential method. It basically, Picks, you pick integers a, b, and m, and some seed r. And then you get the next random number just by multiplying the old one, adding b, and taking the modulus of m with respect to m. It's very simple. And if you look at it, it really looks random. Uh, 
don't 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 use that. <laughs> uh actually people used it for a very long time because it was very cheap it's very cheap to get these random numbers uh but someone realized that there well, well you can see just by looking at it that there has to be some correlation between consecutive random numbers right and and it's called the massaglia effect so if you have you construct sequences of uh uh successive uh, random numbers and you plot them in some kind of, of hypercube uh, it you will see that the, the whole hypercube is not covered and in fact if there is anyone on zoom now you should hear me <laughs> basically it looks something like this so if you generate the direction of, of a particle and you generate phi and then theta and they are correlated it's not good so so we need better things uh, and there are very many very good pseudo random gen random number generators around there uh, and there are a number of things they should in fact cover the full phase space so any any point should be accessible so to speak and they should look random. <laughs> okay. So, what is it? What kind of integrals do we want to do? Well, we want to simulate events. We want to calculate whatever people measure. So how do you measure stuff, right? In, in, in an experiment, you have observables that depends on the particles you see and their momenta, basically. And these can be arbitrary observables. It could be an easy thing, just counting how many particles did I have in this event. So. What is the probability to have n particles in an event? That's, that's uh, unobservable. Some observables are the transverse momentum of a jet. Now, a jet depends on a whole bunch of final state hadrons. So this observable becomes quite complex. But in principle, this is quantum mechanics, so we should be able to calculate what the theory tells us about a given observable. So this is what we want to do, right? This is the core of everything we want to do. We want to be able to calculate the observables from the theory that the experiments measure. And this is what we should do, right? We should, we have a sum, overall number of particles that is produced. Uh, you have a sum over all kinds of particles that can be produced. You have an integral of their four momenta, and you will basically calculate the matrix element squared multiplied by a phase space factor, and then you measure by integrating over this observable. It, it, this is what we really want to do, right? This is nothing else. And if it's a simple thing, uh, like the uh, the Higgs measurement is in principle very simple. You find two photons and you have to calculate what is the probability to produce two high PT photons. The observable here is just the invariant mass of these two uh, photons. And, and in principle, this should be doable, right? Now, the problem is, so the way we should go about it is that we should find some probability distribution in N, Q, and P. Uh, we have integer values here, so that, but that's fine. 
Uh, and we should find, hopefully, a probability distribution that is proportional to this. And if we do that, we can generate these points and we can uh, measure the observable and, and get the, the expectation value for that observable. That is what we want to do. And the fun thing, if we can do this, we can measure the observable in exactly the same way as the experiments do, right? Because they see, ooh, look, two photons. Uh, what is their invariant mass? Easy. Same thing here. We get two photons. If, if not, you just throw it away and, and, and you measure it and you get the expectation value. So this is event generation, trying to find a probability distribution that corresponds to the physical cross-section uh, and generates particles according to that, so that you can measure it in the same way as in, in, the, uh, in the experiments. So this is it's what we want to do. Life is easy. But no. So this matrix elements that you need for your for your for your uh, cross section, it's uh, it's typically very complicated. I mean, for a simple process, E plus E minus going to Z zero going to new new bar. Yes, we can write down the Feynman diagrams. We can calculate the amplitude, we can square it and it's, it's easy. But in general, if you go to the LHC, it's very difficult because there are hundreds of particles produced and you can't write down the uh, Feynman diagram for, for, for that, that amount of par particles. So you basically have typically leading and maybe next to leading order for a small number of particles. In addition, this phase space for n particles is not always easy to probe. So finding this probability density function is usually very, very difficult. So we need more tricks. I, I will show you tricks here. That's, I'm a trickster today. Uh, the thing we can do is that we can produce weighted events, right? If we have a probability distribution that is not quite uh, the same shape as the cross section, we can multiply and divide it and we can have a weight looking like this for each event. That is fine. It means we get weighted events. If you ask the experiments, they, they complain. I don't want weighted events, especially if they have negative weights. How, how do I propagate a negative event into my detector? They don't like it. Uh, but in principle, it's no problem. It's, it's fine. You, you will get the right value for the observable in the end. But you need to have this variance low, otherwise it will take forever to get a reasonable estimate of your observable. And we can do tricks, of course, like we looked at before, this is accept, reject, multi-channel. Accept, reject is, is very, if it's reasonable, this, you can get the reasonable overestimate of, of this uh, cross-section then the accept reject is, is fine. Then you throw away some generated events, but all the, the rest have weight one and the experiments are happy. Um, but as I said, for most cases, we don't even know what this matrix element looks like. So we have to do physics tricks and that, physics trick here is, is, is factorization. 
So the whole idea here is that you have some simple matrix element for two partons goes to a few partons that we can calculate. Now, if that, uh, the scale involved there is high enough, that will be determine the main features of your event. So then you take that distribution of partons and you have something which takes these and, and evolve them with a parton shower. Because we know even if we have two to 15 gluons, we know that each of these gluons will radiate more before, before and after they collide. So we dress it up with, with parton radiation, but the, 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 the integral here is unitary. So we don't change the weight of the event. We, the weight of the event comes from here. Uh, or the cross section, and then this just redistributes momenta and, and particles. And in the end, we take those partons and we turn them into hadrons. Again, with unit probability, we just redistribute the momenta of the partons into momenta of hadrons. And this factorization is very good normally. Not always, but normally it's, it's very good. So this is what I talked to partner showers. I will talk about next, next uh, uh, lecture and also a bit about hadronization. And it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's this divide and conquer. You start with the simple stuff that gives you the main features of the event. Then you add things with unit probability. So you just modify the event to get the hadrons that the experiments actually detect in their uh, detector. Yes? You wish. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, I I could give you a lecture on on how to combine these what we call the matrix elements that we start with with the part and showers that we continue with, uh, and it's complicated uh, called matching and merging, and and it's not simple. Uh, but it's not soft. And I, I will concentrate here on the soft part of the event generator. I will tell you something about it, but uh, uh, in principle, there is some feedback and there are tricks to avoid them. So this is basically what I said before, you dress the event uh, starting from a few partons. So cartoons is always nice. Uh, and this is step by step what we do in one of these event generators. You start out with, in this case, proton, proton, about to collide. You pick out the hard subprocess that you are interested in. You can do inclusive things as well, but if you're looking for a W production plus a jet, you will start out with something like this. And then you will generate this. This is easy. It's just two, good, two goes to two. You write down the matrix elements uh, in, in, uh, in, in two minutes. Uh, sometimes you do two to three because the W ba basically decays immediately, uh, but you could also use the narrow width approximation and, and stuff like that have to decay somehow. 
And then you start thinking about, okay, so these partons that collided, they would have radiated something before they actually collide. So you actually go backwards in time and think about how they, did they come about? Basically undoing the evolution of the PDFs. So in this case, we, we say that this gluon here actually came from a, maybe a valence quark that radiated that gluon. So that valence quark has to be emitted somehow. It will have some PT. So we will give this thing a bit of a PT. Same thing from this side. And then we call this initial state radiation. It is always there if you have collisions. Uh, something will happen before the hard thing happens. Then there are quarks produced, and especially quarks, but also electrons, if you have, will radiate Bremsstrahl. So this will radiate a gluon that will split into other gluons and, and so on. So this is called final state radiation. We also talk about space-like and time-like radiation. Uh, so space-like is the initial state and time-like is, uh, is the final state radiation. But now you realize that we have a bag, two bags of partons smashed together. So this is not all that happens. You can have additional scatterings in this uh, proton-proton collision. You're interested in, in the W here, but you're interested in W plus jet, and, and whatever else happens will influence how, what, you're, what you're actually measure. So this is the typical thing, the absolutely most common process at the LHC starts with a glue glue goes to glue glue. Immense amount of gluons in, 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 in the protons. And of course, this multiple scatterings will have initial and final state radiation. And as these evolve in time, uh, if you're from Lund, you would say that the color fields between them are squeezed into tubes that we call strings. And you get Lund strings connecting all the partons that go out. And these strings will start to break in a way that creates hadrons. And most of these, uh, some of these hadrons will actually be unstable states that will decay until you hit the detector. Now it turns out that each of these steps are not easy, but fairly easy to handle. The pattern shower, we uh, have a, a tutorial that I will not, will not do here, uh, but we have the MC Net is, is a collaboration of, of authors of uh, uh, event generators. Uh, we have yearly schools for PhD school students like this. Next one will be in Durham in beginning of July. If anyone is interested, ask me. Uh, and there we have sometimes a tutorial where, where you, from scratch, write a part on shower in Python. And most students who try will succeed within a number of hours to write it down, but from scratch. I, I, I had to show this as well. This, this is another way of, of, of pictorially su summarizing everything that happens in a, a general purpose event generator. Uh, we we uh, developed this uh, for the latest Pythia manual, uh, which you can find here. Uh, and uh, the fun thing is that there is a, a Twitter site, Twitter account that uh, has a, a physics plot of the month or something like that. And this actually won the uh, uh, the vote for the 
physics plot of the year, uh, 2002. I, I struggle to say it's a plot, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're happy for the attention. But I mean, this basically encapsulated everything that, that happens in, in the picture, but never mind, it's, it's just for fun. So I work mostly with, with the LHC. And as you know, the LHC was built to find the Higgs <laughs> amongst other things, but let's, step back and, and ponder what, what is it that happens in the collision at the LHC. So the Higgs cross-section is around 30 picobars, but the total cross-section is 100 millibars. That's a lot, right? And then you have some other interesting signals, W and Z, top production. Uh, you have uh, on, on the high cross-section part of the things, we have non-diffractive, elastic and diffractive events, which is all these minimum bias garbage that some people think is boring, but I personally think is quite interesting. Jets, people like jets, hard jets, high PT jets, so PT larger than 150 GeV, that's 220 nanobars. And many people like small jets like me. <laughs> and, and here's a funny thing. Uh, the cross section for having a jet with more than two GeV transverse momentum is actually nine times the total cross section. And this is something we will discuss on Monday, what to do about that, because that doesn't look unitary to me. In the other end of the scale, we have beyond the standard model. I... Well, anyway, if, if you just look at it, almost everything that happens at the LHC is QCD, it's strong interactions, purely. QCD, nothing else. Everything else is irrelevant for the, what actually goes on at the LHC. And this is important for pileup because everything you measure, especially now, and even more when they have the high luminosity LHC where they will have on the average 120 collisions in each bunch crossing. There will be a lot of stuff. Take care. We need to understand this thing. And, and it's mainly this soft physics that we would have to worry about. Everything is QCD. Everything else is just fluctuations. Interesting fluctuations, but nevertheless. So any measurement at the LHC requires that you understand QCD. Even if you're looking at the BSM process or electroweak process, which is often easy to generate because you can ignore things like showers and hadronization and stuff. Almost all observable uh, are influenced by QCD. Even golden signals like the Higgs goes to four mu's by a off-shell Z zeros, golden signal. The PT of the Higgs will be completely determined by QCD because the incoming partons creating it will have some PT. So you need to understand what's going on there. In addition, any observable prediction will have QCD corrections. Well, it's the same thing. It, it, even if you can calculate the leading order cross-section for something completely electroweak, you will have a tower of corrections for alpha S. And you can hope that these coefficients are small 
Alpha S is not very small, it's 0.1 something. So as long as these things are well behaved, you can approximate things, but you need to understand the QCD to, to know what's going on. And QCD is, is difficult and it will create backgrounds that you didn't think about because sometimes it will create a B quark, which gives a B meson that gives you a mu that looks fairly isolated and, and yeah, it gives you a background that you need to take care of if you, try, if you do the experiments. And QCD is difficult. And event generators, these general purpose event generators, they are all about QCD. So it's, it's, it's very important to understand. That. And the reason it's difficult is, as I said, alpha S is not very small. The gluon has a self-coupling, which means there are a lot of gluons in the protons and whatever comes out will radiate a lot of gluons that radiates gluons. Uh, so there will be a lot of gluons. And even if alpha S is small, the phase space for emitting gluons is very large. And sometimes in any alpha S expansion, the co coefficients may become very large because of, of the phase space available for gluons. And then in the end, we need hadrons because that's what is actually seen, which we don't have any perturbative theory available to describe. And we need models for parton showers and hadronization. It's, we, we can pretend we know how to do it exactly, but we don't. All right. So I, I just, uh, I don't know if you usually take a break uh, at some point here or, or if. Yes, we, we can have a strike or we will so uh, this would be a, a good place to to uh, okay, so to take a break. Uh, but when you take a break, you don't take a break. Uh, <laughs> you you should ask yourself questions, and I, I will do this. Give you time. I've already had some questions, and that is good. You can ask me anytime. Uh, but sometimes you need to just take a break and think about what is actually going on. What, 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 what is this guy on about? Uh, it's, does he make any sense whatsoever? Uh, and, and which are the questions you, you think I should have addressed and that I didn't? So let's take, a, a, yeah, 10 minutes break now. Is there any password for I don't think so. Negotiate. Uh, 
Back these things to you say, okay, this this hadron came from fluid. I mean, what does it mean to say it came from fluid? It comes from, uh, I don't know what it is. It is, it is true. There's so many problems here. I don't even know where to begin. Um, people are working. I, I, I actually wrote the first paper of this in the 19. Is it quark on uh, differentiation? Yeah. Oh. Uh, using a neural network, very simple. Uh, 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 just as you said, you, you have to define it in terms of what you calculate theoretically. Okay, so you have to define it. So you define it either by saying I have two jets, and according to my calculations, you can create either a form. Or a the question is given that, what is the probability that I can identify this as those four points? So you have to have you have to have a theoretical bias in order to do something. Once you have that, then you can at least ask the question. Then you would learn. The problem is that it's difficult to learn from it. So you yeah. have to learn from the Yes. <laughs> What what a jet looks like depending on whether it comes from yes a hard quark and hard yeah somehow we we need to use some Monte Carlo simulation something like that to yeah but the truth in practice I this is still field of practice but also how do you treat like experimental errors when you're trying to get neural network? Because in Bayesian analysis, I think it's uh, more or less, you know, but with neural network, I don't know. You can take into account. I was involved in this 30 years ago. I don't think I don't know what they're doing, but no, we published one paper years ago. Not using one item, so you can not mean anything, you just look at this observable we need to perturbatively accept the game for the shape of the things. So there we go to all the differentials and we go to almost all the different dimension now to see how they did the then comes the example. I think the dominating one would be this uncertainty. Okay. 
restrictions. I was in this situation the past month. I haven't seen it. I don't know if you're working with No. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we are working across the code and they're using PCA, but they're not experts in PCA. You, you, you're working in um, VHSD transfer code. We are using PCA, but all PCA right now, the first thing I said to Pete, right? So uh, they tune it all. <laughs> now there is a new version, which we are really excited to use, but we have to work a lot to go with it. Is this within the or is it in the So, 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 um, how to say that uh, my question is uh, for PCL so that when you choose your scale in order to uh, produce more neurons, yeah. is do you also like cross check uh, the using different scales? Like if you change the scale, yeah, so it's done automatically. No, no, uh, automatically, no, uh, there, is, there is some way. So let's say this is uh, scale variations mm -hmm. that can be done semi uh, Then you will get basically the same with them out, but uh, each of them will have a different uh, set of different weights corresponding to the different scale variations. Uh, we can use this to estimate the errors to each of the scale variations. That we have. I think there is one of the example programs, but I'm not sure. I can check. And the small question about your uh, events for uh, tutorial thing. Yeah. Uh, so, is, do you have also in, within the MC net collaboration some open code in GitHub? Open code for what? For, for some Python, some, some tutorials for students. Check. Uh, you have a technical decision. You mentioned you had, in addition to the, the hard scatter, the part of shower, you had these additional sub -scattering. How do you deal with them? Do you just have multiple part showers running for those such patterns? In Pythia, it's actually all, all intertwined. Right. Because my question is, if you, if you did that, then you'd have, you'd be missing out on interference. The two part showers. So, yes, we do. Okay. We do. Uh, we're working on, on finding <laughs> ways of doing that, uh, especially in, in the heavy iron conditions. So right now, uh, there are the, the default settings of Pythia, each sub scattering. It's uh, independent channels, except that they all need to organically from the protein. So, so PDFs are kind of rescaled to take that into the global. So that the face, that, that's not the thing you work in the actual. Especially the final state radiation would be. That we're working on. Okay. I, I guess my, my general question is, and I'm sure you'll address it, but in part of showers, this part of happen after the, the M squared computer. So when you're turning one part into the main, or maybe two parts into the main, um, interference effects of quantum mechanical interference effects can't really be added simply. 
so we, 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 we try to take it to count as much as we can. But uh, it's not perfect. I, I'm sorry, the question is more concrete. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll talk about parking cars tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine. Excuse me? Uh, do you, are the slides available? Not right now. Uh, okay. but they don't, sorry, I, I make them available. Okay. Yeah. No, I will. Thank you. Okay, shall we uh, continue? So, so now I'm going to talk about the things which are somewhat easy. Uh, um, which is the, the, the first step, the generation of the hard subprocess. So what we typically do if we, we have a two to n matrix element, which we can get from the standard model Lagrangian basically, uh, or even beyond the standard model Lagrange densities. Uh, the things we have to look out for is that the Tree level things typically have divergences. And these divergences typically happen if some transverse momentum becomes small, which it does if the emitted uh, one, one parton has very small energy uh, with respect to the other or is collinear, or collinear or soft divergences. Of course, we tree level means uh, things are fairly easy. Uh, if we want to go beyond leading order, we get nasty loops and in infinities. We know how to handle those sometimes. And of course, if the number of protons become large, the number of diagrams actually grows factorially. And if it's large, it's very difficult to uh, find the suitable probability distribution for the momenta. But we more or less know how to do this. So the thing we start with is a partonic matrix element. We fold it together with part and density functions. And we sample these at the scale which is typically given by t hat or pt squared of, of the outgoing particles here. Someone asked me in the short break about scale uncertainties. Yes, since we have a, a perturbative series, uh, we will get scale uncertainties and, and we have to take it into account when we say how, how well our, our predictions are. For two goes to two, it's, it's usually quite easy. If you generate, uh, you do a variable transformation, don't generate in X1 and X2 and PT, but in log X1, log X2 and log X PT, you, you get a fairly well-behaved uh, matrix element or, or platonic cross-section. This is the glue glue goes to glue glue, as I said. This is QCT, this is LAC. This is what happens at LAC all the time. And it's, it's fairly easy. Um, but the thing is, if we want to go even here, we need some kind of cutoff. 
And that typically means you have a cutoff of some sort. But if you have more than two part partons, then you will get into this regime where they are parallel or one is very soft with respect to the other. And uh, this is where you use a cutoff, which is basically a jet algorithm. So uh, a typical JET algorithm is the, the KT algorithm, or probably heard of the anti-KT algorithm as well. It looks like this. This is the pseudo-rapidity and phi angle differences between the partons. This is the minimum of the KT of the partons. And if this measure is too small, you cluster the partons together and say that, no. This is below the cut. I will not include this in, in my matrix element calculation. And then if you do approximately the same thing when you measure the jets, then if you're lucky, you, you will get something that, that works. Jet algorithms is, is the subject for, for, for a whole school, if you want. So I won't dwell on this too much. Uh, the thing is that when, when you introduce jets, then these are very close to the kind of original partons as defined by this, uh, uh, well, I don't know where I'm pointing, uh, as defined by the, the, the leading order or next to leading order matrix element. But we must remember that a jet is not a parton. It's close but it's not a parton. And, and in fact, it's, it's not even a jet sometimes. Uh, uh, a jet is not a jet, it's not a jet. It's, it's, a, a jet is in the eye of the behold. Uh, you can define it in so many ways and, and uh, uh, it's, it's difficult. So as I said, if we go to higher order tree level matrix elements, if you go beyond 10, you, you know that the factorial will kill you. Uh, you won't be able to generate anything. Well, we can try. Uh, and remember the, the difficulties in constructing these probability distributions. Of course, uh, we have this multi-channeling that helps us because we typically know the amplitude squared uh, but we want to generate uh, according to the sum of amplitude squared, but we can divide this up by, by doing like this and we get a multi-channel uh, uh, sampling of, of the phase space where each of these typically has a well-known shape, uh, but together it, it becomes horrible. And then we have this thing we want to generate. So predicting the rapidity distribution of a jet produced together with a W, just as an example. If you do the two to two, that this is the process I had in the beginning, then you get a leading order answer to your question, what is this rapidity distribution? But then you can also create, take a W plus two jets or two partons or plus three, three partons. And we have some kind of jet resolution scale to avoid divergences and stuff like that. This is uh, fair enough, but we must remember that we cannot just add these together the one jet and then you add the two jet and then you add the three jet. Because the way the matrix element calculation works is that they are inclusive. So the tree level W plus one jet actually is the leading order cross section for having at least one jet. So adding W plus two jets, you must be certain that you don't have any, any double counting there. And to do it properly, you then would also need 
if you want a true next to leading order calculation, you don't only add the two jet contribution, but you also add the loop contribution to the one jet. So you have a proper expansion also for the one jet here in, in a series of alpha s that you truncate that alpha s squared. Uh, and then you get the next to leading order uh, prediction for this cross section that you're interested in when you add these two together. And you can add these two together uh, and you have to, if you're not careful, because this is typically divergent and this is typically minus infinity. <laughs> the fun thing is that for any reasonable observable, this one plus that one above some cutoff is finite. So you, to avoid having uh, this very negative and this very positive, you, you shuffle this around a bit and, and you can generate proper next to leading order uh, things. This is actually at, at the stage now where you, this can be done automatically for almost any process. For instance, in the program called Mad Graph, no, Mad Graph for at, at C at NLO. Uh, it's a very long name for a very complicated program. Uh, so the thing is, if, if you, you take the, the, the KT of, of one part and with respect to the other, uh, if you look at the real contribution, which is this when you actually have two jets, you will see that it diverges as KT goes to zero. And you have this, the virtual term, which is this loop calculation, which is basically negative infinity. You integrate this to get that, together with that above, uh, below some mu squared, and you will get the finite answer. So this is the trick we have to do. Uh, so when you do this, it's important to have something, some things in mind. So some people say, well, I generated this to next to leading order, and this is my prediction to next to leading order. And they didn't think about what they were actually doing. Maybe they were looking at W plus one jets. So you calculate W plus one jet to next to leading order. And that means you have the loop contribution for one jet and the three level contributions for a second jet. And you think about, well, then I'm gonna look at, what am I gonna look at? I'm gonna look at the Delta Phi between the jet and the W. So you have, you have the W, that's typically a wiggly line, right? And it recoils uh, from a jet and you measure the Delta Phi. I don't know why you want to measure the Delta Phi, but if you want to measure the Delta Phi and you have a Delta Phi that, that is less than two, less than Pi, then, you have to have something that compensates it. So calculation-wise, that actually requires an extra jet. So you think you were generating one W plus one jet to next to leading order, but the leading order for the Delta Phi between those the W and the jet is actually uh, alpha S squared. You have to have an additional a mission in order to get something. Otherwise, you won't get any delta phi. All delta phi's will be, the, the only possibility to have delta phi is to have a second jet. Excuse me? Yeah. So for the total cross section, W plus one jet, that is next leading order. 
but the delta phi distribution is only next to leading order for phi equals to pi. As soon as you go away from there, you only have tree level contributions to the observable. So then it's not next to leading order anymore. Typically, what you do, would do experimentally is to you find the largest jet in, in, your, in your event, and you look at this, and, and you will get, and then you, you've, you're, 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 you're smart, so you actually take the W plus two jets to next to leading order. And then your prediction for this delta phi, uh, whatever it looks like, will be correct to next leading order. Everywhere? Well, if you go down to two pi over three, and you have the angle between the W and the hardest jet in your event is less than this. How do you compensate these two PTs with a jet that has smaller PT than that? You can't, you have to have two jets in order to conserve energy momentum in your calculation. So all of a sudden, you will have an observable, which is delta phi, which you can predict to next to leading order here, but here it's only leading order. So what is next to leading order or not is dependent on your, your observ observable. That's where I was, yes. And this means we need to really think about what we're doing. And often you will find that you have large next to leading order corrections. Then you need to go to next to next to leading order. And then that is a whole other business that becomes really ugly. And if that has large corrections, then you need to do something else. You need to do a resummation. So if you have some cross section for zero jets, which is an expansion in alpha S looking like this, and you realize that, well, this is actually quite large and this is large. What you can do is a trick where you take out parts of these where you know things go wrong. And this is where, for instance, the, in the collinear limit or in the soft limit, where you have a, a, a part on and a very small part on that goes out. And you can calculate that thing approximately in a way such that you can reorganize this series into what we call the leading logarithmic approximation. Even if these actually diverge, you can sometimes reorganize it like this. It's basically just uh, picking up the most important parts of, of this thing of this expansion, the things that are largest, and resum them in this way. And then you reorganize your expansion in a logarithmic ex expansion. Now, so you know that all the terms oops, proportional to alpha s to the power n log of the mu, the cutoff to power 2n those coefficients you get right. And then you can do an expansion in this. So it's, this is called leading logarithmic behavior. And then do expansion into next to leading logarithmic behavior, which 
is where you have one logarithm in mu down. Basically, it's, it's one over the scale that comes in uh, in an integral and that gives you log of things. So you can do that and you can sometimes do it analytically uh, or you can actually do it by using part and showers. And that is what I will talk about tomorrow. So I, I actually compensated for the previous lecture overdrawing. I'm, I'm basically done now and we can have our lunch and time. So in summary here, many people use event generators as black boxes. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> it is wonderful that, that you can just sit down and simulate events and then you can toy around with them. But when sometimes you have to realize that there is a lot of things going on there. Some of it is on very solid theoretical ground. Some of it is not. Uh, if you try to look into it, it's basically incomprehensible. There's all sorts of parameters and switches and, and things you can mess around with. And it's difficult to know what to do and what not to do. But uh, in principle, what we're doing is actually trying to give you a way to in, perform this integration I, I had in the beginning to see what is the prediction for this observable you're interested in. And even if it's complicated. Questions? Hungry? So tomorrow, as I said, pot and showers, a bit of hadronization. And then uh, after lunch, uh, I think it's best if we meet here, all of us. Uh, the tutorial I want you to do is uh, a standard tutorial, which actually uh, comes with a distribution of Pythia. And you can download, it tells you how to download the newest and shiniest version of Pythia that was actually released one and a half weeks, a week, weeks ago. How to install it and how to do some simple runs. And I want you to do that basically treating it as a black box. <laughs> uh, but now you know something about what goes on and, and uh, we will continue doing that. Continue in the other lectures to tell you more about what is going on. So when we do that, uh, as we said before, uh, if you want, you can go to your rooms and do it. You can in principle, go downtown and have a beer and do it at home later if you want. But when you do it, I will be here to answer any questions. My yeah, colleague, Albi, uh, who is a postdoc in Trieste, he will also be available to answer any questions. So if you get stuck and uh, I just want to say that in to be able to do this, you need a computer. <laughs> you need a network connection to download the stuff. You need a Unix-like operating system. So Mac or, uh, or Linux. You need a C++ compiler, C++ 11 or later. If you don't have that, we will have to think of a way. So then you have to tell me. Uh, and we'll try to fix it in some way. Doesn't have to be it's enough if you have access to a computer somewhere else uh, that you can do it. All right.